Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Glad you're here, and I'm glad I'm here, too. It's always a pleasure to meet with brethren that want to serve the Lord, that want to go to heaven when they die. And I'm sure if I ask each one of you want to go to heaven, what would your answer be? Yes. It'd be yes, wouldn't it? And that's the reason you're here, because you want to serve God. You want to do the things God would have you to do. You want to be one of His children. You want to exemplify what it means to be one of His children. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being willing to listen to me this morning. I appreciate the elders inviting me to be here. You know, this congregation has supported me in Van Buren for a long time, or for several years, put it that way. They've done that for several years. You've been very, very kind to me, and I appreciate very much what, what all you've done for me. And some of you send me cards from time to time. I've got them in my briefcase over there. You send me those cards. I keep them. Marty tries to keep all of them because she doesn't keep the ones that they send to me. They don't like me. We don't keep those. But you haven't ever done that. You've never done that. And I appreciate the fact that you're interested in what, what we do in Van Buren. We've had a lot of problems. I'm sure you have too with all the rain and all that. We've had a lot of floods. I put that in the, in the report. We're just about to get back to normal. One of our families still has to go around Highway 64. They messed up the bridges and they have a hard time getting to us, but they come. They come all the time. And, but as I said, I'm glad to be here. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you love Jesus? Do you love God? If I were to ask you that question this morning, what would your answer be? Well, obviously, every one of you would say yes. You'd say, well, James, we wouldn't be here if we didn't love God. But I want to talk a little bit about what the Bible says that tells us whether or not we truly love God. What the Bible says about the necessity of doing certain things to prove that we love God. It's easy to say that we do something. It's easy to say that we love. It's easy to say that we love our wife. But she knows whether or not we really do. Those of us who are men, she knows that. It's easy for a wife to say she loves her husband, but I'll tell you what, the husband, he knows whether or not she does by the things she practices. And that's true about loving God. We can say all the time we love God, but if we don't do the things God would have us to do, God tells us we really don't love Him. Turn with me to Philippians, the first chapter. We're going to look at some things in the, the first chapter of Philippians. What the Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippians. One of the interesting things to me about the book of Philippians is it's the only one of the epistles that Paul writes that maybe there was not anything going on in the church that he had to deal with except maybe what he talks about in chapter 4. When he talks about the two women there, they, they need to get along. Well, I'll tell you what, men need to get along too. But as he writes to them, basically this church is an example to us of what a congregation ought to be. It is a congregation that loves the Lord. Turn, if you look with me in chapter 1, he's writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at Philippi. But as he writes to them, of course, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, I write the same thing everywhere in every church. So as we look at what Paul had to say here, he would say the same thing to us today. Now, maybe the specifics of a difficulty that certain people are having wouldn't be available or wouldn't be happening in the congregation of which we're a part today. But the basic principles that are found in the book of Philippians ought to be found in every congregation today. So let's look at what the Apostle Paul says to them. He says, I thank God, verse 3, upon every remembrance of you. And if you're looking at your Bible, I'm, I'm looking at the New King James. You can look, use any one of them you want to, as far as I'm concerned, as long as it teaches the truth. But here the Apostle Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now he said this before to some other congregations too, but what's interesting to me about this is, every remembrance that Paul has of this congregation is one that's pleasant to him. Every remembrance of these people, he says, I thank God for this. I thank God for the fact that I can remember you, and I remember you all the time. And I always, in every prayer of mine, make a request for you. And he says, all with joy. So he has joy when he remembers them. I wonder what will happen when I pass from this life. You know, it's a point under a man wants to die. I wonder if people, when my name comes up, James Lusby, if it does come up, I wonder if they'll frown or if they'll smile. I wonder if what they'll say is, you know, what? everything we knew about James, everything that we understood about him, every relationship we had with him was the kind of relationship it ought to be. 
That's the way it ought to be for all of us. It's interesting that Paul says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. When I was preaching in Oklahoma City a number of years ago, there was a family there, a particular person there, that was born in the objective case and indicative mood, what I suggest. That kind of a person was always complaining about everything. She never found it. Well, I shouldn't have said she. But that person found, never found anything right in the congregation. The elders could never do anything right. The preacher shouldn't, he could, shouldn't, couldn't do anything right. The song leader always read, led the wrong songs. Everything was wrong. Our Bible classes weren't what they ought to be. She never said anything good about the congregation. Well, she got sick, and she died. And to me, the sad thing about that is, after she died, not one member of the church ever mentioned her name. You think about that. This woman had been a member of the church for years, and when she died, nobody had a good remembrance of her. Well, that's not the way it ought to be. It ought to be that when we pass from the scene, or when we move to another congregation, we move to another town somewhere, that people remember us in such a way that they remember us with joy. And that's what the Apostle Paul says about this church. I remember you with joy. Well, why, Paul? Is it because you fed me? Is it because you gave me some clothes? Why is it that you remember me with joy? Well, he tells us in verse 4, or verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. From the first day that he met them, from the first day that he preached to them, from the first day that he made contact with them, from the first day until now they had had fellowship, and he remembered them. Fellowship means joint communication, doesn't it? That's what it means. So he remembered them what they had done for him, because they had sent once and again into his necessity, he says in chapter five, 4. So he remembered them from the first day until now. They always did the things they should do. Marty and I have a very warm heart for this congregation. Most of you don't really know me. You, we're, we're, we, we haven't known each other. We haven't gone out to eat lunch with each other. We haven't done things. But you have supported me and the elders. I have such a fond recollection of this congregation. And Marty and I talk about it oftentimes. It reminds me of the first one I ever preached with in Oklahoma City the 10th and Francis congregation. They were so good to preachers. And you are too. And so I have this same remembrance from the first day that you started supporting me until very, this time right now. I have this fond memory. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about from the first day until now. And then he says something else. Here's another reason he thinks of them with joy. In verse 6 he says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Their reputation was so good. Paul had so much confidence in them because of how they had done from the first day until now that they would continue to be faithful to the Lord. Isn't it true that sometimes we meet people and we don't even get even any thought that they wouldn't be faithful to the Lord? We realize that the kind of life that they've lived and all the actions that they performed and, and the example that they've been sh to us shows that they're always going to be that way. I loved my grandmother, Browsey was her name. That's what we called her. Her name was Browse, really, but the boys called her Browsey, the little ones. I loved her for a lot of things. One reason why, she made fried pies. I'll never forget the fried pies. She had an apricot tree out back of her house. And she would go pick those ripe apricots and make a fried apricot or apricot, depending on how you, <laughs> how you talk about it. But she would make those fried pies, and they were so good. And I can almost taste it today, <laughs> that fried pie that she would make. And I remember all the wonderful things that she had. I love to go see my grandmother because, you know, grandparents have a tendency to spoil their grandchildren, don't they? That's one of the wonderful things about being a grandparent. Marty and I are grandparents now. We love to spoil them. The great thing about having grandkids is when you get through with them, you can send them home to mother and dad. That's the great thing about that. But I remember her, and I have a fond memory of her. Well, the Apostle Paul is talking about that. I'm very confident of this very thing. What would cause confidence in, in the Apostle Paul? He had seen how these people operate. He had seen what they do. He had, he had observed their faithfulness unto God, and their fidelity, and their energy in wanting to serve God. You wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't want to serve God, would you? So there's a confidence that you're building up in the minds of other individuals because of the kind of life that you live. 
the Apostle Paul, as he speaks to them, he says, it's right for me to think this way. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in our assembly this morning, in our assembly worship. I'm going to talk about what it means to be right. And there is a right way to act. But the Apostle Paul said, it's right for me to think this way. Folks, there's a right way to think. We live in a society today where the idea is neither, nothing is either right or wrong. If it feels good, do it. If you like it, fine. If you don't like it, fine. You just do whatever you want to do. That's sort of the idea in our society today. But the Apostle Paul said, it's right for me to think. It's right for me to think of this of you all. He said, it's right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Well, I suppose the Apostle Paul always wanted to do what was right to individuals, and I suppose he always thought of them. He even thought about the Corinthians, and they had a lot of problems. He thought about other congregations that he wrote to them, the Galatians, and they had a lot of problems. He thought about all these things, but he says, Unto this particular group, I have you in my heart. I don't know whether he's singling that out as much as I might. But I think about that from this standpoint. Because of the kind of people that he were, he had a warm place in his heart for them. You're the kind of people I like to be around. You're the kind of people that serve the Lord. You're the kind of people that a congregation ought to be. I want to go there. Let me ask you something, folks. Did you get up this morning and say, I can't wait to go worship God? Did you do that? I can't wait to be with those people and that song leader's going to stand up here and we're going to sing and we're going to raise the rafters of this building. We're going to worship God with everything we've got. We're going to worship Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I can't wait to get together with other brethren and do that. Well, when we have each other in our heart, that's what we want. We want to be around those that, we, that are in our heart. I used to hold meetings, and Marty couldn't go with me. I still hold meetings, but Marty couldn't go with me at one time because she had a business. And I would drive, I remember, I would go all the way across Arkansas. I'd go into Alabama. I'd go in places, and I would preach there, and she'd be at home, and my children would be at home. And when it was over with, usually it was over with on Friday night at that time. Sometimes they went two weeks. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? But most of the time it was, on, it was over with on Friday night and I'd get in my car and I didn't care how far it was home. I was going home because I wanted to get back to that person that I loved, that person I had in my heart. That's where I wanted to go. Sometimes we say because the bed sleeps better than the one in the motel. <laughs> But be that as it may, I wanted to go. I wanted to be back with my wife. I wanted to because she was in my heart. And let me just tell you something. She still is. She still is. Now that's what Paul's saying to this congregation. He said, God is my witness how greatly I long for you all. Look at verse 8. I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Two things in here. Paul says, I have an affection and Jesus Christ has an affection. I long for you. Why? Because I have you in my heart. I long for you. You're a part of my life. I think about you all the time. But he says, I have the same affection that Jesus Christ had for you. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Do you think Jesus Christ loves us? Do you think he loved us at one time? Do you think he still does? Do you think he has an affection for the world? For those individuals in the world, do you think that he wants everybody to be saved? Do you think his father has that same kind of a concept? Do you think that maybe Peter was right when he said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering, not wishing that all should perish, but that all should come to repentance? Well, I think so. Jesus Christ had an affection for us, or he wouldn't have come to this world and died for us. He wouldn't have done that. Then he said, I pray in verse 9 that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are in Jesus Christ. Do I really love Christ? Do I really love God? He's talking about I want your love to abound more and more. He tells us why, but he doesn't tell us love for what necessarily. We sort of have to imply this, or we have to give inference to this, don't we? But he says, I want your love to abound more and more. And the reason is, I want you to be able to approve the things that are excellent. When he's talking about love here, 
You suppose he might be talking about the love of God? You suppose he might be talking about loving Jesus Christ? You suppose he might be talking about loving the things of Jesus Christ and the word of Jesus Christ? You suppose he might be talking about the fact that we ought to study, to present ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed? You suppose he might be thinking about the same thing that he told Timothy, till I come give heed to reading, to exhortation? You suppose he's talking maybe to preachers and says, preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching? You suppose he's talking about loving the Lord so much that he is the center of your life? There used to be a, a popular little thing that people wore on their wrist. Do you remember that? What would Jesus do? You remember that? That was really popular. Not so popular anymore, I don't suppose. I don't see them in stores to be so. But there was a time when people would buy those, and what it was supposed to do is, especially for teenagers, so before you do something, think about whether Jesus would do it. What would Jesus do? Well, maybe that was a facetious way to talk about things. But actually, there's some truth in that. We ought to think about what Jesus would do. But one who loves God will do that. He will do that. He will love God so much that he will do the things that the Lord would have him do. When he says here in this verse, that you may approve the things that are excellent, he says, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, that you may abound still more and more, he says, with the affection of Jesus Christ, that you in the knowledge and discernment, of these things that, will, that are, you've been taught about Jesus Christ. That word abound is an interesting word to me. In the Greek, it literally means something that's more than enough. It means something, we might say it means something that's teeming over with something. It's teeming with something. Ladies, did you ever, or men too, did you ever put a pan on the stove and you had a liquid in there and you... Maybe one of the children got to crying or something. You had to run and see about them. Or maybe there was something else going on. And you forgot it was on the stove. And then all of a sudden you might smell it. And you hear it crackling. And you come running in. Oh no, it's all over my stove. And I'm going to have to clean all of that. You know what it was doing? It was teeming. It was bubbling over. It couldn't contain itself. The, the pan could not contain it. And that's the idea of abound more and more. It's teeming over. In other words, you love the Lord so much that you couldn't keep it in. I had a good friend one time, Lafayette Pounds. He's dead now. But he was such a spiritual individual that we would go out to eat, and everywhere we went out to eat, he would talk to the waiter or the waitress or the wait person, as they call him today. He would talk to them and say, uh, talk to them about Jesus. He would talk to them about the Lord. He was interested in their soul. And every time he went somewhere, that's what he would talk about. And when we were together, he'd talk about a passage of Scripture. My dad was a lot like that. I remember one time we drove up to Greer's Ferry. My dad lived in Amarillo, Texas. We drove all the way to Greer's Ferry. You know where that is. And we went fishing. And we're sitting in a boat. And he's throwing these lures out here, and I'm trying to figure out how to do it. And he's throwing these lures out here, and he's bringing them back in. He said, James, check me on this. Now, folks, I was about probably 18, 17 or 18 then. That was only three years ago. No, I'm kidding about that. I was only 17 or 18 at that particular time, and my dad said, check me on this. And he began to quote the book of Matthew. And I thought, check you on that? I don't have a New Testament to check you on that. My dad could quote the entire New Testament from heart, folks. I wonder why he did that. Well, somebody said, well, he's a preacher, and that's what they're supposed to do. Well, if we're all supposed to do that, some of us are in trouble, aren't we, Mark? <laughs> some of us are in trouble. But the fact of the matter is, he, he, what he would do is he, would, he had a little list of things that he did every day in his office. One of those was two hours he spent memorizing Scripture. I've still got it. It's about this size. Two hours memorizing Scripture because he loved the Lord so much. He wanted to be able to put in his mind every word that Jesus Christ or God or the apostles had to say through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. And he could quote the entire Bible. That's what the Bible's talking about when it says abound in these, bubbling over with these, bubbling over with this. That's what you want to talk about. 
But he says, I want you to, I, I want you, your love to abound. Love for what, Paul? What I would suggest to you, one of the things is love for God. In Matthew 22 and verse 37, the, the writer there, Matthew, records the statement of the Lord. But actually this goes back to the Old Testament. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Did you say this goes 30 minutes? Is that what this class does for the Christians? 30 minutes? 940. Well, I'm going to have to hurry then. We preachers like to talk, don't we? <laughs> That's what we like to do. But I want to talk to you a little bit of what, what it really means to love the Lord. You love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. You know what that means? With every fiber of your being, you love the Lord. Nobody has to tell you to seek first the kingdom of, God, of the Lord or the kingdom of God. Nobody has to tell you to put the Lord first because you love Him with everything you've got. Now I'll tell you something, folks. When we get to that point, and I'm not saying you're not there, don't misunderstand, but if we ever get to that point, and if you've gotten to that point, nobody has to tell you you need to worship God. You're just going to do it. Someone says, why do you go to church? Well, that's my life. Why do you worship? That's my life. That's what I do. Not because somebody tells me I have to. It is not difficult for me to do that. I love the Lord with all of my heart. We love because He first loved us. And when He tells us to do something, His commandments are not grievous to us. They're not burdensome to us. That's what John said in 1 John 5 and verse 3. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and they're not burdensome, they're not grievous. They're not difficult to do. It wasn't difficult to get up this morning, was it? And go in the mirror, look in the mirror at yourself and comb all your hairs and all that kind of thing. Was it difficult to get ready to come and worship God or did you want to? The Apostle Paul said on one occasion, as much as in me is, I want to. That's what he said in Romans, the first chapter. As much as in me is, that's what I want to do. He's talking about preaching the gospel, of course. But as much as in him was, that's what he wanted to do. Why, Paul? For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also the Greek, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith into faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. If a person is righteous, he lives by faith and he wants to. What I'm trying to tell you folks is we've got to get to a point, if we haven't already, that the Lord is the premier thing that we think about and He has the first place in our lives. And before we do anything else, we think about the Lord. And you don't have to wear something on your wrist. You don't have to do that. It's just automatic with you. It's, in, it's built into you anymore. It's not just a habit, it's your life. It's what you do. That's how you think. And you don't have to think about, would Jesus do this? You already know. Because He is the center of your circumference in your life. So let me ask you again, do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Do you understand what it means? Herein is the love of God manifested in us that, we, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Do you love God? When John was writing in John the 21st chapter, he said, he, that said to him, he said to him a second time, and this is Jesus to you, Simon, Simon, do you love me? Lovest thou me, Jesus said. And Simon said to him, Yea, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Well, if you do, tend my sheep. If it's really true that you love me, you'll do something. You won't just talk about it. You'll do it. You'll tend my sheep. That's what he said in, Matthew, in John 21. In John 14, he said, He that hath my commandments and doeth them, it is he that loves me. That's the reason we need to study and find out what Jesus has to say. That's why we open our Bibles and study. We have Bible class. You're fixing to have a Bible class, and you study in there, but we study at home too. That Bible, we read that Bible. Sometimes I go into the homes of people who are supposed to be members of the church, and there's no Bible to be seen anywhere. And sometimes they might want to impress me and say, Son, go get that book that we love so much. This is an old story, by the way. 
And the story is that the son ran in and got, at that time, Sears and Roebuck catalog. That's the one they love so much. Well, that ought not to be. It ought not to be. It ought to be always that it's the Bible. That Bible that sits there on the, on the table that has the names of all our progenity in it. It ought to be worn a little bit because we use it. It contains the words of Jesus Christ, those precious words of Jesus Christ. Do I really love God? Do I study to present myself approved unto God? Do I do that? In John 14, verses 23 and 24, Jesus was saying, If a man love me, he will keep my word. And listen to this. And my Father will love him. So this love for me is contingent upon whether I love the Lord, isn't it? Now, I'm not talking about that God didn't love the world, because He did. He loved the world so much He sent His Son to die for us. I understand that. But the love of God to me has to do with whether or not I'm going to love Him. That's what He's talking about. And we will come into Him. That's what Jesus said. We'll come unto Him and make our abode with Him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my words. How do I know whether I love God? This is why I ask you the question. It's easy to say I do, but the old expression, the, the proof of the pudding is whether or not I'm doing what the Lord tells me to do. Because if I don't do what the Lord tells me, the Lord says, you don't really love me. You can say it all day long, but you show it by your actions. A number of years ago, I preached the sermon for a godly woman, or a, ser or the, a funeral sermon, for a godly woman. Her husband was not a member of the Lord's church. He would drop her off at the building every Sunday, and then he would come back and wait in the parking lot to pick her up. He never, ever worshipped one time with her while she was alive. And after she died, he bought the biggest spray of red roses to put on her casket. And he came to me the, the week after she died and sat in my office and tears were coursing down his cheeks. He said, I wish I had done these things while she is alive. He said, you know, I loved her, but I never did tell her I loved her. I never did show her I loved her. I could have sat in the pew with her. Whether I agreed with what you were preaching or not, I could have sat in the pew with her. I could have been with her. But I went my way, and she had to go her way, and that's what we did in our life. And now I wish I could make it up to her, but of course he couldn't. You can say every day you love your wife, privately, but if you don't show her you love her, you don't love her. Real love will be seen in our actions. Real love will be seen in our words. What we say toward one another. If a man loves me, he'll keep my word, Jesus said. And he said, if he doesn't love me, he doesn't keep my word. So what does, what does that mean? It means I need to know what the word of the Lord is. That's what that means. Do I really love God? James, do you really love God? Well, look at your life. What, what is it an example of? Is it an example of Jesus Christ? Do you walk in His steps? You know, the Apostle Peter said He's our example or example that we should walk in His steps. We know whether or not we're walking in the steps of the Lord, don't we? If we don't, we can find out by looking into His mind, into His Word. One of the great things the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 is, we have the mind of Christ. And of course, he's talking about the apostles there. But be that as it may, those apostles wrote to us. He said, I write the same thing to every, everywhere in every church. I mentioned that a while ago. So the Apostle Paul had the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit inspired him to say certain things. He wrote them on passages of Scripture, or on paper, and so we can read them today. We know exactly what's in the mind of Christ. If we'll just read it, make it a part of us. Do we really love the Lord? 1 John 2, verses 3 and through 5, the Apostle John was writing about this. It's interesting to me how often the Apostle John said basically the same thing Jesus said. And that's, that we shouldn't be surprised about that since they had the mind of Christ. But he says, particularly in verse 5, Whosoever keepeth his word, in, verily hath, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected or completed. Do I love the Lord? 
if I keep his word, I do. I'll tell you what, brethren, that's why we study. Someone says, I, I don't know why I need to attend Bible class. I don't know why I need to read my Bible all the time. I go to church, I sit there, and the song leader leads songs, and the preacher preaches a long time, and I can't wait to get out and go to the restaurant and eat. But I go all the time. Let me tell you something, a person does that doesn't have the concept. He doesn't understand what it really means to love the Lord. Marty and I were in Dallas recently, and I listened to a preacher there. I hadn't heard a preacher preach an hour and 45 minutes in a long, long time. I'm not going to do that to you. But I thought, my dad used to preach that long. Every meeting he was in, at least an hour and a half, and people would just sit there. I realized the preacher ought to have something to say, and he ought not to repeat all the time, I understand. But this one didn't do that. He was talking about the Lord's church, and he went into all the ramifications of what the Lord's church is. And it was really a good sermon. And we sat there, and I didn't see anybody twisting and turning and thinking about, I've got to get to the cafeteria, and there, it's going to be late, and we're going to be late getting there. I read in the Old Testament that some of the times the people, the, the prophets would speak the word of the Lord and read the word of the Lord to them and they would stay nearly all day. And the interesting thing is, sometimes they stood up during this period of time because they had such an affection for the Lord. Do you have an affection for the Lord this morning? You answer that question. Do you love the Lord? Do you love him enough to do exactly what we read in Psalms 122, and verse 1? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's how glad we ought to be. Well, thank you for listening.